Hi, welcome to the Oliver Fetter YouTube channel. Today, I wanna to talk about how to make more power on your VW 1.6 liter diesel and how to sustain that making more power. I'm gonna break the video down into two parts, where first, we're gonna talk about how you make more power on your diesel engine, and the second part, we talk about how to safely make more power on your diesel engine, and there's definitely some blend to both parts. General disclaimer, I have tried all these things myself, and if you've watched many of my videos, you know this car gets broken very often. So, do not do any of these things without thinking about it thoroughly, considering your options, especially considering the sustaining the power options that I'm gonna give you, and then applying them to your engine. But I have zero responsibility for you breaking your car if these things do that, because they will and can do that if done improperly. That's my disclaimer. It's too hot. How do we make more power on a 1.6 liter diesel? First, let's talk about how do you make more power on a diesel engine in general? The way you make more power with any given diesel motor is that you add more air and more fuel. That could mean that your engine is physically bigger, you bored it, stroked it, whatever, have more sweat volume so you're getting more air, and then you just add more fuel and you would have more power. Now, on an engine like this, we really don't have a whole lot of room to bore or stroke jack shit. The obvious answer is put a turbocharger on it. Now from the factory, if you have a turbo diesel, and this video I would say is somewhat turbo diesel specific in the sense that you could turbo your naturally aspirated engine, but it probably wouldn't go that well. Kinda wanna try it still though. You're in the same boat as me, and you got this 1.6, your best option is to turbocharge it. So with a turbocharger, hypothetically speaking, it compresses air using your exhaust gases, so you're getting a denser air charge, and this is where I say in theory, because if it's not intercooled or anything like that, it's not actually gonna be denser. You add a turbocharger, you get a denser air charge, and then in order to make more power, all you have to do is inject more fuel. So that boils down to turbocharger plus fuel pump tune equals more power. So I'm gonna go through the specific ways you can increase your 1.6. We're gonna assume turbo diesel already, engine horsepower starting with the easiest and going to more complex. Super easy, super accessible. Ooh. Tuning your fuel pump. Right here, this baby, they're all mechanical, which means to adjust your fueling, like two screws to play with. You have your max power screw, which basically sets where the control collar inside this fuel pump releases fuel. So you can increase your injection duration and you can change where it idles. By increasing injection duration, it naturally increases the idle. It means you'll have a really high idle if you don't do anything else and it might rev hang. Let's say you already have the factory turbocharger on here, you got factory everything on here, easiest bang for your buck, for sure, 100% is to retune your fuel pump, you will immediately have a gain in power. Following that up, the second best thing you can do, still on your fuel pump, still with your factory turbocharger, is to remove the governor from your fuel pump. Now that gets a little more like opening up your pump, taking things apart, actually getting mechanical, not just adjusting something. The governor in these pumps is basically a flywheel with weights. And at a certain RPM, it starts to push a rod back against the fuel collar in here. So essentially at a certain RPM, your fuel pump will cut fuel to the engine. You're gonna naturally lose power, especially at your top end. So that gives us step one, let's tune your fuel pump. Step two, do the governor mod, and then again, tune your fuel pump. So that puts you at like looking pretty good already, all things considered. Now, anytime you're adding more fuel, you're richening your fuel mixture, which isn't necessarily ideal unless paired with your turbocharger. And for two, you're adding more combustion gas. So if you're starting with a stock VW turbo diesel engine, increase the amount of air you're getting and increase the amount of fuel. Ideally, you'd be getting more air and more fuel thus more combustion, thus more power. If you're gonna start doing that at all, the stock turbocharging system on a 1.6 is non-intercooled. That means after a very small amount of pressure build, you're starting to get hot air instead of dense air. Here comes caveat number one. Increased air pressure does not mean increased air density. They're not the same thing at all. Factory turbocharging system doesn't run an intercooler in any capacity which means even from the factory, that turbo is really starting to blow some hot air instead of dense air. If you start screwing with fuel and air, you should immediately add an intercooler as well. Air to air or air to water, I use a big air to air intercooler in the front of mine, will increase the density of your air charge. Turbo sucks in air and compresses it, it's actually doing work on the fluid. 
So as the turbo is compressing air, the air is actually getting hotter. And how much hotter can be pretty drastic. In my case, if I'm running even 20 PSI of boost pressure, then you can be seeing as hot as like 300 degrees worth of intake air just from the turbo. It's the turbo performing work on the air increases it that high. With 300 degree air coming through this tube, that wouldn't be the greatest thing to feed the engine. It's really not dense, it's hot, the molecules are moving around really fast. When you go to feed it in, it might be 30 PSI worth, but it's not a high density air charge. So you run it through your intercooler, which removes that heat from the airflow, or at least some of it. By the time it gets over here, you have a much denser air charge that's gonna give you more power. And that'll benefit both the durability and your power in your engine. You're getting denser air, so more power, and you're getting cooler air, so a more reliable engine as well. That fits in both categories. Let's say you did all those modifications. You've tuned your fuel pump, you've increased wastegate pressure, and you've added an intercooler. So there's no actual scientific way without at least an air density temperature sensor somewhere to validate that you're doing it quite right. But it's a good guess that on the stock turbocharger, probably getting kind of hot in here as of right now. So you have more options. It's time to consider a bigger turbocharger. From the factory, these had a K15 and or maybe a K17 turbo. Especially the 15s are very small. And the thing is the turbo and what's so tricky about turbos is sizing them correctly. So as soon as you start adding more fuel to this, it starts to act like a bigger motor than what it was shipped out as. In the sense that it's putting out more exhaust gases you can start running bigger and bigger turbochargers because you have more exhaust gas to spool that turbo. So increasing your fuel and increasing your turbo size should kind of be done at the same time within certain brackets of increasing your fuel. On a stock pump, you can tune these up pretty dang high. Like higher than most turbos you could size up to, before you really need to worry about your pump being the weak link. One of my best setups as far as uh, being consistent, being reliable and being powerful was a GT2052 turbocharger. That's a fixed vane Garrett turbocharger. Paired that originally with the stock exhaust manifold with some welding shenanigans. And then eventually I paired it with a Mark III manifold with some more welding shenanigans. And that's a really nice combo you're starting to get a better flowing manifold that collects it nicely paired with a turbo that can handle providing enough air for the amount of fuel you're throwing at it. Now, a few years ago when I dynoed this car, my setup was original manifold with GT2052 turbo and original intake manifold and this intercooler. Turbo diesel pump with no governor and increased fuel tuning. Without the propane adder I had at the time, I was making about 75 horsepower to the wheels. Now, before everyone goes, that's too low, it's not the right number. I said to the wheels. Wheel horsepower and crank horsepower are completely different things. People who sell you engine parts and people who sell you cars always advertise crank horsepower because it's a higher number and it sounds good, but the realistic number that you can actually measure in real life without a super specific dyno is wheel horsepower, which means there's a parasitic loss to your gearbox, to your CV axles, to your bearings, to the interface between your tires and the dyno. With this all tuned up on a dyno, we got 75 horsepower to the wheels. And that was a pretty nice setup. Then comes the propane power adder. I threw some propane at that thing and it got to 80 horsepower. And then I threw some more propane at that thing and it bent the rod. So you can see it's kind of a fine line. Let's say you tried that out, great. Or you didn't want to try that out. You want to go really big on the power then what you should consider doing is immediately swapping the head of your pump, meaning this injection pump has a plunger inside of it that actually pressurizes the fuel for each injection event. You should upgrade from what these cars come with, which is a nine millimeter pump head to a 10 or 11 millimeter pump head, which is found on the newer TDI injection pump. This gives you a drastic increase in the amount of fuel you can inject, which Relatively speaking, gives you a drastic increase in the size of a turbo you can spool. These are general guidelines. The actual turbos and parts you would need will vary and would require various skills to put on the engine. If you're getting away from your stock turbo, I could see it being a real bind for some people if you don't know how to weld. It's extremely helpful to know how to weld at least V-band flanges onto manifolds in order to start experimenting with different turbos. 
as well as working with oil lines and other things like that. If you're also going shooting for the moon, the next thing that you should really consider doing that's both the intake and exhaust manifolds on the 1.6 from the factory are complete garbage. If you look at them, they're narrow, they don't flow well. In fact, I've even seen unequal cylinder wear on my original motor because of the way the manifold distributes air into the cylinders. Pretty crazy. The exhaust manifold too is very short and very small and generally doesn't collect air as efficiently as it could for your turbo. So that could bring you along to doing more advanced modifications like intake manifolds and exhaust manifolds, which should be paired with porting your head. Now porting a head sounds pretty scary, but at the end of the day, all you really need to do is take the head off, take the valves out, and then just a light port. Nothing crazy, no $4 billion on a CNC machine, but we're talking put your intake manifold and exhaust manifold gaskets on the back of the head, trace where there's extra head material with the gasket, and then remove that material so that you're getting a clean transition from your head to your exhaust manifold. And likewise, you should take that same gasket, put it on the exhaust manifold and intake manifold and make sure those ports are lining up perfectly because you want a nice clean transition from your engine to your manifolds and vice versa. This should be taken as a general overview video on how to do this. I have many videos of my personal builds and how they turn out, but if you were just wondering like, hey, how would you, how would you make more power safely on a 1.6? That's this video. But each thing I'm saying requires probably few hours of digging into to really understand what's going on. And maybe that just means there's gonna be more of these videos broken into smaller sections so I can think and deliver more clearly about how to do it correctly. That brings us to the second half of the video, which is how to sustain your power modifications. And I would argue you're way better off starting with power safety modifications than you are starting with power modifications in general. If you start by upping the power on your build and then replacing things as they fail, you're gonna have a bunch of failures and you're gonna be tearing your shit down more frequently than not. And that's been very much my personal experience on how it goes. Now, how to make power safely on these is actually relatively straightforward. They are pretty bomber engines in general. I have sent many a piece of shrapnel through these motors and they still run afterwards. It's pretty impressive. But the two weak links that for sure 100% exist, number one, the head gasket. And I'm not saying that the head gasket itself is the problem here. A lot of people suggest you should jump to a multi-layer steel head gasket and they're right, it would be an upgrade, but you don't have to do that necessarily. What you should be doing though, immediately if you're deciding to touch how much boost you make or you're trying to add more fuel, is take those factory head bolts. If you have the 12 millimeter head bolts, you should pull those things out, throw them in the trash and replace them with some ARP head studs. You can look them up on the internet. Type in VW 1.6 diesel ARP head studs, or I'll put them in the description too. But they are the single, easiest, most straightforward, most save your ass upgrade you can do if you're about to start fooling with the turbo system on these. A good set of ARP head studs installed correctly and torqued correctly will keep any head gasket issues from ever happening in the first place. I run about 30 PSI through this engine and I do not use a multi-layer steel head gasket. That is purely because it doesn't fit on this head. This is the old style turbo diesel block it's got one oil passage down the front, no multi-layer steel head gaskets fit this. Otherwise I would use one. But that said, my composite gaskets don't fail. They work fine. You know why? ARP head studs. So that's number one. Put head studs in your car if you're gonna start upping the power on it at all. Number two, if you're starting to really up the power, I mean, if you have your nine millimeter fuel pump maxed out, if you have your fuel screw turned in, and your idle screw turned out until your car is rev hanging pretty much, and you have your turbo putting out 20 plus PSI, you should really consider doing the rods. The rods in the stock engine, people will tell you they're good, but they're definitely not. <laughs> and anyone that tells you the stock rods are good hasn't put enough power through the engine yet, hasn't put enough fuel in it. When you put enough shit in these motors, the rods bend. And that's not the end of the world. It doesn't ruin your engine. It's not like catastrophic turbo failure where your engine inhales a bunch of metal particles, but you're gonna have to take your engine apart. That said, there are great options. Max Speeding Rods, which is my not so favorite, favorite company, makes 
awesome H beam rods for like 400 bucks. You can put them in, check that everything fits nicely, and then never worry about your rods bending literally ever again. You could do as many modifications as you want, your rods are never gonna bend. So awesome, awesome upgrade there. Worth the money probably every time, assuming you're really trying to hot rod this engine. We've covered what I consider the two things you need to do to make this motor reliable, head studs and rods. And then the third thing, that is what's gonna save your ass, kind of, every time, and that's absolutely necessary, is your stock cluster doesn't tell you really any information. Now, what they sell on the internet these days is like a voltage meter, like a water temp gauge, and something else useless, okay? Don't bother with the triple gauge clusters, they don't tell you anything. You need more than three gauges to tell you what's going on in your engine if you're running it on the boards. Gauges I consider absolutely necessary to understand your engine is a water temp gauge. You need a water temp gauge that's highly accurate. The stock one just kind of waves around, there's no numbers on it. Don't go off of that. Put a gauge in, put the lead in a place that actually reads the water temperature running out of your head and into your radiator and know exactly what temp your car is at. Overheating your car is a sure way to have it fail. An oil pressure gauge. Your dash has a little red light on it, that's not helpful. Get an oil pressure gauge that's zero to 100 PSI that tells you exactly what your oil pressure is going to the engine. If you don't have oil pressure ever, turn your engine off. That'll save your ass. Exhaust temperature gauge. Now in these engines, if you're running them hard for a long time, exhaust gas temps get really hot. In fact, that's the number one side effect of adding more fuel is that your exhaust gas temperatures go to the moon. In this car, I had a 500 to 2000 degree exhaust gas temp gauge and when I was drag racing it, it would be thoroughly pegged at 2000 plus degrees. I mean, all the time. It would get there to probably within like a gear and a half worth of pulls. So people on the internet too love to say, oh, if you run it over 1600, it's gonna break. If you do this, it's gonna break. No one actually knows when it exactly breaks at what temperature for how long. It's really a game of like, how long can your engine sustain that temp and not do permanent damage? That said, with my over 2000 degree temps I've seen, when I last pulled this engine apart, I got some cracking on my injection, pre-injection cups developing on my head. And aside from that, everything looked totally fine. There's no heat damage. So I would say perhaps the head is a slight weak point when it comes to high temps. But aside from that, you're looking pretty good. Get an exhaust gas, exhaust gas temperature gauge and monitor it and get used to seeing what it is. Generally in diesels, over 1600 degrees sustained for long periods of time can cause damage. And by long periods of time, we're talking like towing things across the country. If you're doing a quick pull down the highway for like 30 seconds, that's fine. But if you're like driving this car up like a 40 mile long hill and you're at 2000 degrees the whole time, you're gonna have an issue there. So see that, know that, and understand that. And then that brings me to the last two gauges you should probably get to be smart about tuning this. And that is a boost pressure gauge and a turbo drive pressure gauge, or otherwise known as an exhaust manifold pressure gauge. And now these are actually both just boost gauges. You would buy two boost gauges. Now one boost gauge should connect right about here. You should be checking your manifold pressure. I have mine connecting right about here, which isn't ideal. That's the pre-intercooled pressure, but I should have it like right about here. And then the second gauge should be connected on your exhaust manifold or on your turbocharger. And that goes for the EGT probe as well. You should have on your exhaust manifold a pressure port and your temperature sensing port. You should have both of them coming off. So boost pressure obviously is what everyone knows about turbos. It's your intake pressure going into the engine. That's a great thing to keep track of. It doesn't mean a whole lot on its own. It's not telling you air density or anything like that, but it is a good number to look at and keep in mind because it's telling you what your turbocharger is throwing at your engine. And that's a good thing to meter. The second thing to keep in mind is the drive pressure. So an exhaust manifold pressure gauge or a turbo drive pressure gauge will tell you the pressure coming out of your engine. Now this may seem less important, but I would argue it's even more important because it'll tell you how your turbo's doing. And it'll tell you if your turbo's the correct size. If you're getting 20 PSI of boost and 40 PSI of exhaust manifold pressure, your turbocharger's not doing shit. 
You're just getting back pressure. So if anything, for one, it's a great safety tool. If you have a ton of back pressure and a ton of boost pressure at the same time, you're really stressing your turbo. That could be extreme turbo failure right there. But on another hand, if you're working through tuning this engine how you want, that is the best data you can see is what am I getting for boost pressure and what am I getting for drive pressure? If I'm getting more boost pressure than drive pressure, my turbocharging system is acting efficiently and it's actually doing what it's supposed to do. Head studs, rods, gauges. Lots and lots of gauges to tell you what's going on. So now like, let's put that all together in kind of a tiered system, right? Because you should be pairing your engine reliability modifications with your engine power modifications. And then if you're lucky, your engine won't just blow up a bunch of times like what I did because I didn't know what I was doing. Let's, let's call it stages. I don't actually know what performance stages ever mean. They don't make a whole lot of sense to me, but we'll define our own scale here and say that, let's say a stage zero build is exactly as it rolled off the factory line. You have a stage zero VW turbo diesel. Then we could say a stage one which would be relatively easy and robust, would be to tune your fuel pump, to increase your turbo pressure, to intercool the system, and to add head studs. That'd be minimal cost, minimal-ish BS to set up, and you'd get pretty maximum benefit out of an otherwise very stock engine. Pretty easy, pretty approachable, and then it'd be bomber. And I would pair that stage one with getting an exhaust temp gauge, a boost gauge, and at least knowing what your stock dash gauges mean and when the lights come on. We could then define a stage two as an upgraded, everything included in stage one, plus the rest of the gauges you need to actually know what's going on in your car, a bigger turbocharger to flow more air and create a denser air charge, and a more aggressive fuel pump tune. That might include removing the governor, it might include tuning it to rev hang and things of that nature. And for a stage two, I would recommend a GT 2052. It's a great turbo. And I think there's a lot of other options that you could apply as well. The other thing to keep in mind with these tunes is for me, I have this hood stack because it's easy. When I'm changing things around, I only have to figure out how to make the exhaust go to right there. But if you have a full standard, you know, 0.5 inch, <laughs> I'm exaggerating, but VW stock exhaust, if you're trying to go to like a stage two big turbo tune, you're going to start getting back pressure from your small exhaust on your car. I'm not recommending you put on a hood stack. Like it looks cool, but I think the practicality of it is like zero because you're just always smelling exhaust fumes and it's like probably hazardous for your health. But I am suggesting on a stage two, you should probably look at putting in a larger diameter exhaust to actually benefit from more flow that you're putting through your engine. That brings us to a stage three where I'd highly recommend you put better connecting rods in that won't bend. You're using a much bigger turbo potentially than stock. You're using non-OEM manifolds to flow more air. You've ported the head and you've changed your fuel pump from being a nine millimeter to a 10 or 11 millimeter head that flows way more fuel flows is a funny term, but pumps way more fuel than ever did before. Something else to consider pairing at that point with the rest of your build is that these engines tend to get a lot of heat soak in the sense that if you start running a lot of boost and fuel through them, they get hot pretty damn easily. So I would argue a stage two or three should also be paired with some kind of oil cooling, whether it's an improved version of that stock, you know, oil to water plate, or really it should be some kind of separately mounted oil cooler and thermostat to make sure your engine is gonna be okay. In a stage three, you might also have modifications like a secondary inline pump to feed your main pump fuel more quickly to make it easier to prime, to do all those kind of things. In the stack of tiered stages I just presented, I am pretty much creating three steps to my current build, which I would consider very much a stage three 1.6 build. I'm not actually sure how much further you can take this engine before you just have sustained overheating problems and other 
associated failures like head cracking and that kind of damage. So I would guesstimate, and I am only saying guesstimate because I do not have any numbers to back these up, but we know the stock engines made 70 to 80 horsepower at the crank. So that's kind of your starting point on a stage zero, except this is like a 40 year old engine and car at this point if you own it. So you could probably knock a few horsepower off for that. Maybe the rings are worn, maybe things like that. You're probably not at 80 horsepower. So then you can go to your stage one where you just tuned it up. I'm sure you pick up a decent number of horsepower there. Let's say, let's just say the base is 75. Then maybe your stage one where you just tune some stuff and throw an intercooler on it, it might get you to like 85 horsepower, which is still like pretty respectable. And then let's say you do your stage two. You still got your stock intake manifolds. You've changed turbos. You're adding more and more fuel. It's going pretty well. Your engine hasn't blown up quite yet. You're probably making about what I made when I dynoed my car a few years ago, which is about 95-ish horsepower at the crank. Pretty good. Then let's say you do a stage three. And I have not dyno tested this shit at all, so I don't actually know. It's definitely making more than it used to, just by the drag strip runs. So, it's probably making well over 100 horsepower. I would say it's definitely below 150 horsepower, but I'd put it in the 110 to like 120-ish bracket, which is a complete guesstimate. If I were to set out and build myself a new 1.6, which is kind of what building this 1.9 is, Without any hesitation, I would immediately do head studs and connecting rods. I would upgrade both those things before the engine ever goes in the car. And that's kind of what I would suggest if you were really serious about making some horsepower and screwing around with these is you might just want to pull the motor and go through it to start. New rings, new rods, and head studs. From there, you at least have a bomber engine to start with. I would then immediately change my pump head to an 11 millimeter. It's just way better. You don't have to have the rev hang. You don't have to have the gig along injection duration you do that when you're turning in the power screw on a nine millimeter head, it's just better. I would immediately add an intercooler. I would immediately add an oil cooler with a thermostat. And I would immediately throw away the stock manifolds. And then I immediately throw away the stock turbo and put a way bigger turbo on. At that point, you're looking pretty good. You got a built motor that can deal with the power. You got a fuel pump that can supply enough fuel. You got a turbo that can flow enough air. You got an intercooler keeping things from being not dense, and you got an oil cooler and gauges and stuff to support the fact that you have a tuned up motor. With all those things playing together, you could have a real rocking ass time in a car that otherwise people thought is really freaking slow. So I hope this video is useful. It was pretty hard for me to muddle through all the ideas on how to make more power in one setting like this, but hopefully it comes out decently for you. If you're interested in upgrading your 1.6 and you found this video helpful, then you should check out some of my older videos where I was in earlier stages of this engine build we're looking at right now, where I was exploring these exact same things in a much more trial and error based way. Final word of caution, don't buy cheap turbos ever. <laughs> Thank you for watching. Hope you have a good day out there.